Hello everyone, how's it going? In the last biochemistry video, we were talking about primary structure and the sequences of polypeptides. But in this video, we're going to dive a little bit deeper into talking about secondary, tertiary, and even quaternary structure. So we can finally talk about folding and our proteins. In order for us to talk about secondary structures, we're first going to talk about one property about polypeptides that kind of limits the possible secondary structures in which we can form. It's the very fact that certain bonds in the polypeptide chain cannot fully rotate 180 degrees. This is because the carbonyl carbon and the bond between the carbonyl carbon and the nitrogen cannot rotate. This is because we have a partial resonance structure between the double bond of the oxygen and the nitrogen. So when looking at the polypeptide chain, we're only allowed rotation between the bonds of the nitrogen and the alpha carbon. Remember, the alpha carbon is the carbon attached to the R group, and the alpha carbon and the carbonyl carbon. So we're only limited to two bonds that can fully rotate. Because of our limitations on rotation, we can imagine the polypeptide backbone as consecutive rigid planes that meet at the alpha carbon. Because of this scenario, we form some dihedral angles. A dihedral angle is just the intersection at two planes. And there's two main ones that we focus on. We focus on phi and we focus on psi. Remember, when we talk about angles and rotation, we're looking at Newman projections, something we talked about with organic chemistry. So more or less, we're talking about a perspective such as atoms that we're focusing on down our line of sight. The phi angle, focuses on the carbon, nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbon, whereas the psi angle focuses on the nitrogen, alpha carbon, carbon, nitrogen bond. It seems confusing at first, but it's all a matter of perspective. In theory, we would want to say that phi and phi would have all possible angles from negative 180 degrees to positive 180 degrees, full rotation, but that isn't the case. And that's because of steric hindrance of the R groups. Steric hindrance would raise the energy because of repulsion of certain angle conformations. And so when we talk about secondary structures, it's just only specific angles that are possible. And a secondary structure is consistent of values of phi and phi throughout the entire structure that's consistent. First and most common secondary structure is the alpha helix. It's a helical structure that is stabilized by hydrogen bonding, the R groups of the amino acids are protruding outside the helix, and there's about 3.6 amino acids per turn. The main reason why this right-handed helix is so common as a secondary structure is because of the amount of hydrogen bonding holding it and stabilizing it together. Each turn of the alpha helix is held together by 3 to 4 hydrogen bonds, and where 3 to 4 hydrogen bonds alone might be insignificant. As you add up each of the turns of the helix, we start getting more and more stable. There are some factors that can destabilize the helix, such as bulky residues being repeated too close to one another, and R groups that repel one another being too close. But for the most part, alpha helices are the most stable secondary structure. The second most common secondary structure is called beta sheets. And this is kind of just a zigzag orientation where the R groups are protruding in alternating fashions outside the orientation of the sheets. Now, because of the amino carboxyl orientation, there's two different ways we can look at beta sheets, anti-parallel and parallel. Anti-parallel meaning that every other zigzag orientation has alternating amino and carboxyl orientations where parallel the two adjacent chains have the same orientation. Now in parallel beta sheets, there are less hydrogen bonding, so it's less stable. But in anti-parallel, there's more hydrogen bonding. Hence, we have a more stable secondary structure. There are some protein structures that are just consisted of repeated secondary structures. For example, alpha keratin, when we think about hair and nails, is just two right-handed alpha helices that are coiled and twisted together to form a really strong, packed, left-handed helix. And this is what gives keratin its strength. 
The trend of having tightly wounded helices for strength is something that we see repeated with collagen that's in connected tissues, tendons, and cartilage, for example. In this case, we have three left-handed helices that are tightly wounded against and with each other to form a really tight right-handed superhelix. Now, I know we kind of did a fast forward jump with talking about fibrous proteins, but now I want to take a step back and talk about tertiary restructure. I think it was a good idea to talk about fibrous proteins since they were just repeated secondary structures. When it comes to tertiary restructures, it's the three-dimensional arrangement of the polypeptides in space. So this might have, you know, different alpha helices and beta sheets. But since beta sheets and alpha helices connect readily, hydrogen bond with one another, they're going to form different layers in the proteins. Also, hydrophobic regions of our secondary structures and polypeptides are going to be within the structure and hydrophilic regions are going to be outside the structure. This is going to help thermodynamically stabilize the structure. Now we're ready to talk about quaternary structure and one of the most vastly diverse protein types, globular proteins. Quaternary structures are different tertiary structures that might come together to help us make a functional protein. Now the reason why globular proteins are so diverse is because they're influenced by the different shapes, folds, and orientations that the polypeptides take to create functional proteins, such as different motifs and domains. Motifs being recognizable folding patterns of two or more elements, such as two or more secondary structures. A good example might be a beta-alpha-beta beta motif or a beta-barrel, which are just different orientations of our secondary structure. Or a domain might be a protein structure that is stable on its own. That means taking out of the original protein, this domain is still stable and maybe sometimes still functional. Because globular proteins are so heavily relied on different folding patterns, we have to talk about how the amino acid sequences are actually folding. And this is what we call as beta turns. Beta turns help give globular proteins their shape, having amino acid residues fold. Each fold consists of four residues that help change the direction of the polypeptide element. Now, there's two types of beta turns. We have one that consists of proline and one that consists of glycine. Now, these beta turns are usually on the outside or the edges of the protein. This helps stabilize it because we can readily form hydrogen bonds with water. And we know the more hydrogen bonds we can form, the more stable our structure can be. So oh, this video contained a lot of information about proteins and globular proteins and how all these elements come together, but we're going to explore some of the beautiful factors and machines these amino acid sequences form when we try to understand enzymes in upcoming videos. Well, I hope this video about protein folding, secondary structures, and alpha helices and beta sheets was really helpful. Remember that all these graphics that you see me use in this video are for free download in my website, and the link is in the description below. I hope you guys have a great day.